China, 1901. The century of humiliation continued to drag China into darkness. That September, the Boxer Protocol had been signed, marking the end of the Boxer Rebellion. During this time, the great powers of Europe began placing their spheres of influence on various areas of China. For Russia, they had their eyes on Manchuria. For the past decade, Russia had been slowly constructing the Trans-Siberian Railroad, starting from Moscow and reaching Vladivostok in 1903. However, they planned to go even further, extending their network to reach Port Arthur, which gave them access to the Yellow Sea. But Russia wasn't the only nation who had interest in this region. Further east was Japan. The Japanese had been expanding their empire since the days of the Meiji Restoration. Their biggest conquest was taking Korea, which the Japanese gained after winning the Sino-Japanese War. However, seeing the other powers begin carving up spheres of influence in China, Japan thought about doing the same. This conflict of interest eventually led to the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, and after Japan won in 1905, Russian morale plummeted. The empire may have been crumbling for the past few decades, sure, but losing to an Asian power? Inconceivable. So it is here, in 1905, where our story begins. St. Petersburg, January 22nd, 1905. Mid-morning. Father Capon had been leading a march of peaceful protesters. He was delivering a petition to the Tsar. It was filled with terms of reform and a small reminder that he should maybe, I don't know, rule his people better. But the Tsar wasn't there. But there were 10,000 soldiers. But though it was a peaceful protest, the soldiers fired on Capon's men, killing anywhere between 96 to 4,000 people, with the moderate estimate being a thousand. <laughs> Capon did survive though, but would die one year later from assassination. Anyway, following the incident, later known as Bloody Sunday, Nicholas II refused to sanction the soldiers who fired while also supporting the soldiers' actions, which didn't really help his reputation. And with that, the workers revolted, and the first Russian Revolution of the century had begun. About 800,000 workers across Russia went on strike, with roughly 400,000 in St. Petersburg. One month later, on February 8th, March 2nd, he tried to appease the masses by creating the Duma, a sort of Russian assembly putting checks and balances onto the monarchy. However, the Duma had barely any power, so the workers continued to riot. That September, October, the workers would create the St. Petersburg Soviet, which would rule over the workers' policies and agendas. Fun fact, this is where the term Soviet Union came from. It was a union of Soviets, which is a union of workers' councils, making the Soviet Union literally meaning the workers' union of people's republics, which, just looking at the name, doesn't have the same ring to it. Later on October 7th, the Tsar signed the October Manifesto, which was a sort of prototype to the Russian Empire's first constitution. Because I guess they never needed one for the past 400 years, and it contains what do you expect from people revolting against an absolute monarchy. You know, civil rights, the creation of political parties, giving more power to the Duma, so they can actually do stuff, the works. And with that, the worker strikes kind of just died down after a while, the throne was no longer in jeopardy, and the Russian constitution was made in 1906. However, when the workers stopped striking, the Tsar didn't really commit to the manifesto. He still kept his absolute power and continued to limit the amount of civil rights that was given. But still, the population was peaceful. And that's all that mattered for the next several years. But for the rest of Europe, things were getting pretty heated. The Habsburg dynasty in Austria-Hungary were on the decline. The Ottomans had lost the Balkans, France was still salty after losing the Franco-Prussian War, and Germany was challenging Britain's dominance on the continent. Europe was a powder cake, and in 1914, that powder cake would explode. On June 28th, 
Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated on the streets of Sarajevo. And one month later, with relations crashing down around all of Europe, World War I began. Now, to make sure I didn't reiterate myself from this video, let's skip to here. Reached nearing the end of 1916. While the Western Front had been stuck in stalemate for two years, the Eastern Front had some success for the Germans. This caused an act of desperation by the Russian government, sending soldiers who were ill-prepared, sometimes without any weaponry, to the front lines hoping that they would retrieve them from dead corpses. By the end of 1916, almost 2 million Russian soldiers had died, with more being captured or wounded. So with the Germans gaining territories and the country making sacrifices with nothing to show for it, the Russian populace were not having it. But the Tsar wasn't there. In September of 1915, he was serving as the commander-in-chief in the war effort leaving the country to his German wife and some random monk to rule all of Russia. Yeah. So in November of 1916, the Duma sent a letter to the Tsar saying, Hey, you seem to be in some hot water right now. Maybe you should come back and start some constitutional reform, please. And Nicholas decided to do the responsible thing, and ignored it. Oh no. So by the beginning of 1917, not long after that surprisingly difficult death of that Russian monk, the Russian workers began their second revolt of the 20th century, the February Revolution. In a few months, the Russian Empire would die.